my name is Mike Levy. I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about the math of this epidemic. And the main point that I want to make today was was made about 110 years ago, that these these math models that are that are inundating us right now are useful not so much for the numerical estimates yielded by them, but because they give more precision to our ideas and and guide our future investigations. That, that's right now. I I think a lot of people are asking for numbers, and and I get that. But I think what we really need to do is get our heads around what's going on and get our heads around what we can do about it. So I'm, I'm not going to give any numbers. And I, I like to think about these models like a, a camera, like the old kind of camera. They're, they're, we're not looking for the best model of this epidemic. Each model is to answer a question. And when you focus on one question, you have to let a lot of other things go blurry. So I'll probably prep, uh, I'll present a lot of different models for different issues. And then we put these models in computers, and we don't do this to predict things. The computer is not a crystal ball. It's more like a pen sieve. You know, from Harry Potter, you're, you're kind of pulling the idea out of your head, what's already in your head, swirling it around so you can better look at it and better understand the ramifications of the assumptions that you're making. The canonical model of infectious diseases is known as the SIR model. And you split a population into susceptible, infectious, and recovered individuals. And that's where the exponential curves are coming from. At the beginning, and only at the beginning of infectious processes, we expect things to increase exponentially. We expect the first case to infect two or three more cases, and for those cases to infect two or three more again. And that's where we get an exponential curve. With the current virus, the, the questions that have been asked have changed over the course of the epidemic. About three weeks ago, then the question on everyone's lips was, how many people in the hospital, how many in the ICU. So we focus, we kind of split up the infectious part of the process into, into asymptomatic infections, uh, mild infections, severe infections, and critical infections. But again, this, this model, which is just an expansion of the SIR model, it's still an exponential model. And, we've, and then we try to parameterize it. And this is a, a version of that model done by Allison Hill that, that I worked on. And we find the best estimates we can in the literature, and we put those into the model to make very short-term predictions. And you can go online. There's a link here and, and play around with that model. And we have a, a somewhat pared-down version of the same idea here at Penn, um, done by Corey Chivers and the team at I mean, I've highlighted here the disclosures. If you don't see a disclosure on a model, there's probably something wrong with the model. This, again, I, the focus you can see down here is just on the next week or two. Please don't use this model to, to play the stock market or don't even use it to estimate when you think the epidemic is going to peak and start going down. It's not what it's made for. Why? The SIR models have this mass action assumption. You basically assume that everyone is bumping into everyone else like perfect spheres in a vacuum. And that we, we didn't act like that even before social distancing. And that assumption is fine for very short term predictions, but it, it gets problematic as you ask different questions. Network models are, are useful in looking at how the way we're connected affects an epidemic. And in general, a network model is going to predict a smaller epidemic, a lot smaller. If you use an SIR model to predict how many people are going to infect it with this virus, you'd get about 60% of the population. That's just not right. That's, again, that's not what that model is made to do. These network models might say 10 to 40% of the, of the population, so a, a very big difference. And it'll also tell you that those who are more likely to get infected are those who are more connected. Network models are also helpful for me, at least, to think about social distancing. Up here is how I imagine we were acting a, a month or two ago in these kind of small household or family clusters, but then going out and connecting with lots of other clusters all over the place. And then this is on the bottom is how I imagine we are right now, at least in Philadelphia and in much of the globe. We're in these tight household clusters, sequestered away, but many of us are still making contact with others. The social distancing can decrease contacts between households, but it can't do anything about contacts within households. And this is a critical point. The, the transmission risk within a household is very large. I'm showing down here a table from a study that's in preprint following almost 5,000 contacts of cases in, in Wuhan in early in the epidemic. And about 10% of household contact became infected. And very few contacts that were identified through public transport, and I don't have the details, this isn't fully published, 
uh, became infected. So again, that, that that makes me wonder about the the recent um, questions about aerosolized transmission. I think we would see a higher number if that were really an important part of the of the infection process. So why why does this matter? This these networks help you think about why it's taking so long to see the effects of this huge social distancing effort that we're all doing. It takes an extra tick of the epidemiological clock, what we call the serial interval between cases. Because the change of transmission that are already being played out are going to continue to play out. The virus is already through the door. And well, it's hard enough to control this infection in healthcare settings. You can imagine how hard it is to control it within a single household. So I was asked to talk about Philly, and I, I see that a lot of people are nowhere near Philly who are listening, but um, bear with me because that's it's tough on on the mind of those of us in the city. Uh, we we now have uh, published rates or, or test results from on a zip code level across the city, and I've been watching these over the past couple of days that that they've been available, and it's been fairly uniform, but I'm seeing it more and more. Um, the infection to be at higher rates in more disadvantaged areas of, of the city. And this is a slide by, by Sherry Say in, in our department. Why? Well, part of the reason might be that we're not equally able to social distance. And this is from this morning's New York Times. The, the wealthier were able to social distance about three days earlier than the, the poorest 10 percent of the population. And they're able to social distance much more effectively and completely. Even a small delay in social distancing can have a big effect on the epidemic. We also have heterogeneities in, in uh, underlying health conditions, and this effect is, is very large. This is a very old study from, I don't know, five days ago. The percent of hospitalized individuals versus non-hospitalized individuals with health conditions, it's almost flipped from those who have no health conditions. It's a very strong effect. And we go back to the map of our city, the health conditions are also associated with poor neighborhoods and zip codes. So let me, let me do some, a quick Q&A with myself. When is it going to stop? I have no idea. We don't yet know the effects of social distancing. Like I said, it could take about two weeks to see the effects of social distancing. And we don't have a very good statistical way to measure and quantify that effect. We're really making those methods up on the fly. Will a drug stop it? Not, not the drugs we've been talking about today. These drugs will probably affect the, save a lot of lives if they work, and, but they're going to affect the, the death rate and the, the progression from, from moderate to severe disease. But in order for a drug to really affect the transmission dynamics, we'd have to affect these other parameters. You basically need like an over-the-counter cold, sniffy nose and COVID drug to have a, a big impact on the epidemic. So we could expect, even if we have a drug, we'd still have a lot of infected people. And we need to think through how we would be able to treat them effectively and, and quickly with the drugs that might prove useful. Will the summer save us? No. In fact, seasonality, if it decreases transmission, could lead to a, a, an even larger uh, second wave of an infection. And we're not even seeing much evidence uh, geographically, that seasonality is going to be very important. And, and this is something I never thought about before. But one of the reasons we don't get colds in the summer is because we already got them in the winter. There's slightly better transmission for the virus in, in, colder, in colder times of the year. But that doesn't mean they can't transmit in the summer. They just kind of like, like a meteor coming into the solar system. Eventually, they fall into an orbit because there's better conditions in the winter. But it doesn't mean they can't transmit in the summer. If we manage to stop it, is it going to come back? Yes, ab absolutely. You know, I, I think um, we've been talking about pumping the brakes because the, the flattened curve is, is going to be a bumpy ride. We need to expect it to come back if we still have a large, susceptible population. And at some point, we're going to start thinking about geographically stopping it to come back, whether we like to or not. And where we draw the lines is going to say a lot about us as a society. And one thing we know that isn't working is screening at airports or, or anywhere else. We, we really can't keep out people based on screening because of the large number of asymptomatic individuals. And I'll stop there. Thank you.